What you're looking at here is the NICAPO Minjimbul development concept. You've got the titles, the borders that go all the way around here, and whoops, up and around there, and along and around here. So that's NICAPO on Minjimbul. Now, in the appendixes available with DA21-0010, there are two distinct parts to it. There is the part that focuses purely on DA06-1054 that Peter Van Leishout first submitted in 2006. And after receiving a no answer, then took it to the Land Environment Court and ended up with consent in 2009. And that consent was also with, as the Council noted, I will show you shortly, was also vastly against the, the opinion of the public that was opposed to it. The purpose of this video is to actually explore the information that hasn't been given in DA21-10. And that is the information that brings up to date any concept of what they want to achieve with the nightcap on Minjimbul development in this blue area over here. What has been mentioned that across here they want to put in a construction site office as well as storage sheds. Adrian Brennock has mentioned that they want to put in a sacred geometry pub and a sacred geometry medical centre, which I can only assume is somewhere in this area here. Now, we can only assume this and we can only use all this outdated information to assess this whole nightcap on Minjimbul uh, development because excluded from DA21-0010 is any concept of what will be done in this area. And there is good reason for that. Now this document here that actually comes from the Statement of Affairs, uh, Statement of Environmental Effects, sorry, um, from the Planet Consulting, that is a recent uh, they are the recent town planners for the concept. Cardno were the town planners for Peter Van Leishout's concepts. And it was Cardno that were responsible for producing this diagram. And this diagram has actually been stamped from part of DA06-1054. And one of the few places it is mentioned in the current documentation is under existing approvals. Now I would like to point out the fine point that a lapsed DA does not have consent, it does not have approval, it is not existing approval. The only way it would actually come under that category is if you did that before 2014 and it lapsed considering that Planet Consulting did not get involved for quite some years later, you cannot actually put it in the current context of existing approvals. Even if you are currently negotiating with Council, there is no existing approval and there is no current application lodged. And we would actually consider, and I said that because I will show you very shortly why. Now in this diagram that they, the very rare mention of the actual village and what they want to put in there, in the commercial aspect, what do they want to put in there? This is a very simple question that we should be able to find the answer out to. And in the documentation, which is most of Appendix G, that is almost one third of the pages that make up the current DA21-0010 is dedicated to something that is in its best 14 years old and is outdated onto the concept of the roads and everything that they want to achieve. 
but we are still not being informed. I should have put that as a grey area. And why is that? Well, see section 4 of this C. So we look at section 4, we read down, and we get to this part that says, the concept does not identify parameters or guidelines for the village area, this area over here, as the direction of this village will be subject to a specific and independent DA process. So in other words, the development application that needs to be lodged to know what is going in there has not been lodged yet. And because it is part of a separate lodgement, they're not going to tell you what goes in there because it's separate. That's a bit double dutch. Now we all know that there is a concept in the head of the developers of what they want to do in that area. And considering that, there, let's imagine that they have already put a separate development application together and are actually trying to get it approved to be lodged through council. And when I say approved, I mean it's got enough documentation that it can actually be lodged so that it can go up to be whether it's going to get approval or not, so that it can actually be lodged as a development application. So let's assume that there is already one in place and that there is one in place that is nothing like this or maybe it's very much like it. Because when they presented the open day to the community, all they did was present this idea. And this concept did not even explain how their sewerage treatment plant worked because the other lot that they didn't include up the top here that's owned by Kemp Cove has a great big whopping sewerage treatment plant put on it that would cater for the whole community. Now because they weren't shown this in the presentation people actually queried how is the sewerage going to work it doesn't look very you know they couldn't make sense of it. That's because most of its working components we're on a lot that is actually part of this DA 06-1054 but they actually chose to not put it in. And what is that lot? Well down here that lot has been incorrectly identified where the tourist accommodation is that was approved in 1995 Actually, it was approved in 1994 from the letter I actually have from the council. But uh, regardless of that, it was still approved back in the 90s. Over one lot in the northeast of the site being lot 2 DP 1235488. That's actually very incorrect. But before I point out how that is incorrect, it says here that no alteration to this existing approval is proposed. So in other words, the tourist accommodation that they say is on this lot, they have no alterations that are being proposed. Alright, so I won't show you where the tourist accommodations are. Let's go to the lot 2 where they say it actually exists. Now this is a rather tricky little one, this one. It took quite some time to find at the council. This strip down here on the northeast boundary of Kemp Cove Proprietary Limited is on a completely separate title to Lot 4 DP 737440, which actually is the lot that is associated with the approval for the Misty Mountains tourist accommodations. Now as part of this other lot where they say these tourist, you, I just showed you that they said these tourist accommodations are on one lot, this lot. Well this actually comes down here, crosses 
that little strip and this is actually an easement that's actually included in the title it's not actually a road and so that comes across here and then there's this tiny little bit of it right there on Mandalay Road it is a very odd way to have the title structured because this lot one is actually this through here as well it intersects it's lot 121 this side lot 121 this side but this intersects it and they are classified as roads or easements in some cases you know they are roads in other cases they would have to be easements these would have to be easements through here there are no roads so but it there is here so this part of it is not easement it's actually road if you I don't know whether it'll bring it up yes it will so that's actually showing that it's lot 2 DP 1235488 so that's what lot 2 is and it's within lot 2 that they actually say that the tourist accommodation is located well that's in the middle of Mandalay Road no it's not and over here this is easement and I dare say that that part is actually some type of an easement as well yeah, there uh, I don't know whether there's a road in underneath there I don't think there is I think that may actually just be easement so where are the misty mountains there's one cabin there's another cabin and one moment so what you're looking at here is establishment of a tourist accommodation at lot 4 DP 737440 so it has nothing to do with lot 2 as has been made out in the planet document and if planet are actually assuming that this little strip over here is out of the way of this development then they wouldn't consider it but I then have to actually ask how diligent are they to actually know that these cabins are there not over here now I'll just show you pictures of those as you come down this is what it looks like at Misty Mountains accommodations and in the previous application from Peter Van Leishout he did not show this lot to anyone it, he when he presented it to the public in the community open day he only specifically mentioned this blue highlighted area which in itself was a peculiarity because why wouldn't you tell them about all this other area what did he have in mind to put up there so if you look at this diagram to see what he actually had in mind to put in that area you will see that right up in the misty mountains area where they currently propose to do no work there was a great big that big square is a sewage treatment plant and wet weather storage tanks so back in 2006 when it was presented to the community the community knew that these cabins were in operation so the first thing they would have asked is well what about the tourist cabins and because that whole part was never included it confused a lot of people and over the years there was actually a lot of communications to council because it was involving this part but they'd only presented this part and that was because of well I suppose you would have to say the deliberate intent to not include this lot now let me show you that this is the information that comes from appendix G assessment 11 I think where it is doing the community open day and the feedback on it now it mentions lot 121 DP 13446 and part lot 1 DP 
771335, which is actually the lot that I mentioned that has been changed. It is now lot 11, and it, it is that little bit down here that forms this little sort of bit that goes along the road. So that, what they've mentioned here in those two lots, is only this village square here. They have not mentioned anything about lot 4, which is part of it. And we know it's part of it because it's part of the consent and development approval. Lot 3, lot 4, lot 121. So there was the exclusion of half the story when they were telling the public about what was going on. When they said they wanted to put five to six hundred dwelling and commercial units in, twenty to fifty other structures, shops, motel, conference centre, recreational centre. They also plan to have an oval and these other facilities. Now they, this did raise a lot of concerns, especially when they wanted to put in a pub. Nobody wants to live opposite a pub anyone that's lived anywhere near close to one they echo no matter where they are and drunks can get very loud obnoxious they can fight argue police get called there's um well in the worst case scenario there is the sound of cars taking off and then bang and unfortunately i've heard that on too many occasions so over here on the posters that were presented at the community day, it was also specifically only mentioning two of the three lots. Now of all those that attended on five days notice, they advertised it on the 23rd of May 2006 for the 28th. 96 people showed up and of those 96, 43 people left comments. Now they're being rather generous with their expression that only 10.4% of total attendees expressed opposition. 53 people left without any comment at all so you would not know whether they were opposed to it or not. So of those that actually gave feedback back and you actually know how they feel, very few of them when you read the, the actual comments, they're not very flattering and complimentary to the development. Too many concerns, too many problems, and there were what totaled to be 15 who actually expressed opposition to it, said they would oppose it, they did not approve. But the interesting thing is that after they noted that it was told to the community on this open day that your your submissions, your feedback will form part of the development application so that we can take into consideration your feedback. There's a little star here that says, do not include comments in the report to the DA. Now, it was, these reports were included because I dare say that the applic these this uh, feedback was done in May, report finalised in June, but the process of the documentation for the official lodgement that was in September of the DA, there was already documents and a process, and the council had said, no, you've got to get these things. And I dare say that one of the requirements was to actually find out what the community felt about it the community feedback. That's why it was rushed through with very little notice to people so that the results of it could be gathered and put in so that they could attempt to, all right, now we've given you this report, can we lodge the DA now? So whether the recommendation from the consulting firm that they used to conduct this day was, do not include comments in the report to the DA, 
they may not have realised that it was actually a requirement that they provide that report anyway. So they had to give it whether the answers were flattering or not. But let me t show you what the council actually received as far as submissions. Now this is also in the G appendixes in 11 and it's page 62 of a 99 document that actually comes from the council and on it it talks about how they have twice exhibited the DA. On the 4th of October to the 1st of November 2006 and from the 24th of October to the 21st of November 2007. 350 and 150 submissions res respectively were received during the exhibition period. The vast majority of the submissions were objections to the proposal. So you would say an overwhelming opinion of 500 submissions was, we do not approve. The council initially did not give that approval, but up here they also mention the New South Wales Land and Environment Court on the 19th of October 2007. Now Council can likewise expect that same kind of response from NCV Enterprises if they do not capitulate to give them consent as well. And this is where as a community people should be prepared to back their Council up. They can't afford it, maybe we can help out. Maybe there's someone out there that has got the legal skills that can help out. Maybe we should start a GoFundMe so that we can actually take up that challenge and help the council out when, well, in the scenario that NCV Enterprises do not receive consent for their development application, they will take it to court. They will fight it and it will cost the council money. And because they do not have the money to do what they would like to do to be able to fight it adequately, there will be a fair bit of giving in because they can't afford to do anything else. And in that sense, despite all the overwhelming public opinion that is in opposition to it, no matter how much the council may rule against it within its own regulations, there is still that possibility that litigate, litigate, litigate boys will take this to litigation and get it that way because they have got a very good track record of if they don't get what they want, they litigate. If people say what they don't like, they litigate. They litigate for any reason. And all that litigation costs money. And all you people that are investing in NICAP or Minjimbul are actually supporting their ability to litigate, litigate, litigate. And some of those litigations are unfair use and abuse of the legal system. So in summary, if you're actually looking for an explanation as to what this blue bit in the NICAP on Minjimbul development is going to entail, you're not going to find it out on DA 21-0010. It is going to be on a separate development application and one that they're not even going to give any details even though Planet would actually have details to give out. I dare say very much detail, but they are not giving it out. They could, but they won't because they're saying it's part of another development application. That is irrelevant. If it's part of the overall Nightcap on Minjimbal, there could at least be details included in it so that people can actually make an informed decision based on the whole concept that is proposed. Not, well, all the problems that you could come up with that are associated with this could then only be expanded on with the lack of in infrastructure that they may not have considered 
or with the possibility that not much has actually changed. They will still put in housing. They will still put in all those businesses. It may be a slightly modified concept. Uh, I don't see if they're planning to put houses up here around the Misty Mountains. Well, hey, maybe they can stick in a sewerage treatment plant there too. Maybe they can have their tourist accommodations, sell their house lots and have their sewerage treatment plant as well. We don't know. And they are not giving any information. Planet could give out more information about what is proposed in that area. It's been deliberately cagey. And in that respect, you've always got to worry about, well, what do they actually have planned to put in there? I mean, a pub and a medical centre is all that we actually really know is that they have in mind. But how many other businesses, what businesses? Are they going to put in a community school? Is there going to be a dentist? Are there going to be all these infrastructure services to cater for these thousand people? And it was also pointed out that Yukai at the last census had a population of, what was it, 300? And they're proposing to put a thousand in this area. <laughs> Ridiculous. Even the small towns don't even come up into the thousands. Yeah, and the population that is in those small towns is generally spread out. Because as people pointed out in their complaints about Peter Van Leishout's um, development. We come from the city and the rat race to get away from it, to get into the country, not to bring the city to the country. Everything that has been proposed about Peter Van Leishout's concept was all about bringing the city to the country. And for people that actually appreciate the value of the country, this is exactly the opposite of what belongs in the country. This is the kind of development that belongs in cities, not on the edge of border and national parks and historical lands. And it is, I mean, not many people appreciate the fact that this caldera over here of this volcano is one of the oldest volcanoes on the planet. It used to be a super volcano. It's billions of years old. It has a living history. And it has just been torn apart by progress. And while people say that progress is inevitable, no, it is not inevitable. What is inevitable is if you let progress go unchecked, it will take over everything. There has to be a line, a line drawn everywhere to protect some part of what we have in this world from progress, from being stripped away. Look at the context of where they want to stick all those houses. They want to take from that out of some of the most ancient land in the world. As I said, this was the heart of a super volcano and it was probably largely responsible for forming the land mass that is now the continent of Australia. This is in essence like the birthplace of the land. And this is why it is sacred. And if you had I suppose some appreciation, even from a tribal perspective, you would understand that these areas are protected for a reason. And to take up all of this land is, it's just an abomination. I know that most people that would actually move to the country would never want to move to the country to this. Most people actually want a house where they can't see their neighbours, 
can't hear their neighbours. In fact, they can actually have the illusion that they can exist in this world and there's nobody else in it. That's why people move to the country, for the quiet and the seclusion. All of those things are in jeopardy with this development. Not only for the people just in the local area, but for all the traffic that then is going to be going along the road. If there's going to be a pub starting up down here, well then you could have people coming in from everywhere, all hours of the night, all manners of goings on. I mean, one can only hope that it wouldn't be like some pubs in the area that have, well, I'm not talking about the UK one, I, I wouldn't know. I actually haven't been into a pub in a lot of years, so I don't actually know too much about them at the moment, but um, in the day, <laughs> Yes, I wouldn't say that uh, the Nimbin pub was actually a very good one because there's too many that fall out of that pub and start yelling at the tourists and call them all the uh, disgusting names. It's not very charming. And this is in the middle of the day. You could be walking down the street with your kids. And this is what you may end up with. And this is what they're concerned about, even with just the initial one, that Peter Van Lyshout had going in here. Too many people, not enough work, not even that they can commute to enough work. There is going to be a lot of unemployed people and if you've got a pub there, there's going to be a lot of those people ending up down at the pub and fear that it's going to end up like another bad version of Nimbin where with all its problems and there are many in Nimbin, and the least of them actually is the actual pub. Most of it is the, the drug abuse and everything that goes on with associated with that and how that has escalated into high usage of ice, which has then escalated into more violent episodes, more car, police car chases and more violence, more domestic violence more of all the things that people don't want not in their community and certainly not across the road from them or where they can hear all this being yelled out as i know that there's probably more than one of you that actually have been in a circumstance where you've actually heard these people carrying on and it isn't a very pretty thing to listen to in fact, uh, that's when you really wish that the cops could actually do a little bit more than what they can. But for all that what we say that they walk around and they're a law unto themselves, they really aren't. They are really bound by so many laws and restrictions that they can't do too much at all. So, yes, they do have arrogant attitudes, some of them, when they walk around. <laughs> That, that goes with the badge though, doesn't it? And that goes with the person and the ego attached to the person. That doesn't go with the job. Because I have certainly met some really nice, decent human beings. And they just happen to be cops too. And they are really good cops. They are the ones that you'd actually like to meet. The ones that would stop and help you. Rather than the ones I encountered in at Hobart that said, well, no. I wouldn't pay any attention if I saw that going wrong. That's not the kind of police I want working in, in an environment. I want more like you had the old plod, ones that knew everybody in the community and pretty much only reined in the problems. Yes, there were a few things that they, they let slide because they were no biggies. But then there are other things that, you know, they were right on the ball and no, they are not going to let that happen. But now with the taking out of the police stations from these rural areas so that you really don't have a local constable that knows you, you know them, and it's something where they can just show up one day and say, look, you know, we had so-and-so, blah, blah, blah. It's never a simple and easy thing these days. It is usually something that ends up confrontational. So of course anything that's going to involve bringing the police into it and 
at Nightcap or Minjimbal. There have already been reports of police chases from Lismore to the front gate of 3222. That's a pretty long drive and a radical road to do a long chase on. And I tell you that if anyone's coming in the opposite direction, extremely dangerous. And uh, they actually wonder why police would actually pursue anyone along that road because of the risk, especially between Nimbin and Kyogre Road. It is so much more windier, so many more blind corners. Uh, it's an accident waiting to happen. But then again, I've also seen police chases down coming through other areas that are just as bad and neither the person running nor the police tend to give too much worry about that. And again, that is another concern on the road. Accidents. If you're going to be drawing in more people that are going to be reliant on unemployment benefits and supplementing their income in other ways because the, the jobs aren't in the community, and what are you going to be able to do if they do do something? How do you actually make a complaint and get to anybody that's in this community that may have done something wrong? They'll send out the developers and they'll put in their protection mode and, oh no, you can't come on here, you can't do this, you can't do that. They've already got this planned. Mark McMurtry, one of the developers, is a political activist, thinks that Australian law is invalid. Adrian Brennock, the other developer, is an undischarged bankrupt who doesn't tell anybody buying in that he is a bankrupt. And Adrian Brennock, as I can quote from his own video words, believes that local council are invalid. And it's maybe because they believe that they are invalid and that these people at NICAP or Minjimbul can do whatever they want because they're invalid is why just before Christmas they started clearing away the whole hill of 3222. And before I finish up here I will just show you that. Because over here in this blue area in 2006 just as the development application was being lodged a complaint came in from someone in the area that said that illegal works was actually already being done and the development application hadn't even been lodged yet. And I thought, well, that sounds so familiar because the development application for Nightcap on Minjimbul was lodged on the 14th of January 2021. If you look at the cover letter from Planet Consulting, I think that was dated the 22nd of December 2020. So as Planet are getting together the development application, let me show you what they were doing at 3222. So this isn't the first time that illegal works have been done by the same people at Nightcap or Minjimbal in this area. The same people that actually allowed illegal works to go on before in the incarnation of Bulla Bulla community and other various names. They are still the same people behind this illegal earthworks right now. Uh, be prepared for it. I'll show, tell you that the photograph you're about to look photographs is of this area here and this area over down here. And this was taken shortly before Planet on December the 22nd were writing their letter to Council to put in the development application and meanwhile at 3222 they're bringing out the bulldozers as if they've already got that approval and they're ready to start stage two constructions and selling lots like over there at Mebane Springs. They got in the bulldozer and they bulldozed. You can see the little house up there in the corner up there, all down there, all over here. That's a lot of devastation. But the worst, one moment. The worst thing about it was that it was actually du during a time of heavy rain. 
and a lot of what was stirred up in the illegal earthworks has ended up in the Tweed River. So there's a, there's a whole lot of dirt now not on the hill that's actually in the river along with the pump that is no longer attached to the house at 3222. It's another story. This image here is actually this bit down here that they've cleared and I'm highlighting this because there is an exclusion zone near waterways that you need special permission to actually go over that exclusion zone. They've gone right up to the waterfront with their bulldozing. They don't even have permission to bring in the bulldozer to do all that work so they certainly do not have permission to go within that exclusion zone and go right up to the riverfront. Now, a little bit after that, well actually at the same time, on the 16th of December, after all the cabins have been removed from the caravan park, see this is where the cabins used to be and now they're not, the caravan park is actually closed. And as it's closed on the 16th of December, people start arriving. This caravan has been there since the 16th of December. Its power is running into the Sphinx Rock Cafe. Its grey water is running out over onto this other area. Right, so I just took the titles overlay off so you could see that a little bit better. None of these buildings exist anymore. As I said to you that showed you, all of those buildings have been removed. Then all these people start showing up, which would have been really handy if the caravan park wasn't closed because they could actually go in there legally. Instead, this caravan's parked here, this four-wheel drive's parked here. There's three cars up here. You can only see two of them. The other one's tucked behind. These people are camping there. They're waiting for something. There's another one here that's camping over by the river. And there's also a bus next to it. But you get the same image as the one next door because you can't actually see the bus very well even though you can see it's there you can't get a very good image of it. So all these people started showing up just before Christmas at the same time when they got in the bulldozers and completely cleared these hills off which actually gives the impression to make it look like that they've actually just doing stage two clearing the land works so that now you can put your house lots in there but this was all done without consent and this is why they were served notice to stop work before Christmas for these illegal works and that doesn't take that's got nothing to do with that down here either or what may come about because of what Dolph or whatever they're doing over here in this area over here but Dolph Cook isn't giving any permission to council to come and have a look and inspect and see. But Dolph Cook is only one quarter owner. The majority owner is Peter Van Lyshout and he is actually already given permission for access to his properties. And the other quarter owner is Darko Kovac. So Dolph Cook can only deny access to the council on one quarter of that land title. That is his one quarter. He cannot speak for Darko Kovac and he can't certainly take away the permission that Peter Van Lyshout has given council where he says, yes, you may inspect my properties or his share of the property. So, Dolph has been a little bit uncooperative in not allowing things to be inspected up there. Maybe he has something to hide. Maybe it's not 
industrial hemp that he's got going. Mm, lots of maybes. And on that note, I'm going to leave it and leave further discussions for other videos.